by thanking the organizers um, for the invitation. It's a great honor and an enormous pleasure to be here to celebrate a good friend's birthday. Um, so what I'm going to do, first I'm going to tell a little bit um, about how Guy and I met, how it has been working with him, and, and then I'll explain what the talk is about. So Guy and I met in Sayak in 1995 at Fred Gehring's 70th birthday. And then um, our collaboration started in 1997 at the at MSRI in that famous harmonic analysis um, semester in the fall. Um, so working with Guy has been has been a pleasure, um, has been fun, has been frustrating at times, and has been very rewarding. So let me explain um, each one of them. So it has been fun as. Um, you'll see he's, one of the things I will do is um, I will mention some of the peculiarities of his writing style. At least when he writes with me, some of it gets edited, but um, you'll get a chance to hear what goes on in the initial version. Um, then um, it has been frustrating at times, and I want to apologize, I'm going to tell the story. So the main sources of frustrations have been two. Um, one of them has been resolved, the other one I think will never. The first one um, occurred when he refused to wear his reading glasses until way past. He needed them. And we had these, um, <laughs> our, our papers tend to be rather technical. And we spent hours and hours arguing over the, uh, over the exponents. And I will say, it says these. And then he'd go ahead and correct me. And he was reading. And then I realized he was correcting all the exponents. And then, uh, only later I realized he couldn't see any of the exponent. He was <laughs> guessing then, and that's why. Now he wears glasses, so we're done. Um, the other problem comes, and it's funny because several of you have mentioned these, have mentioned the technique, and every time I've looked to him, and he shrinks, but he has been very polite, he has a very deep aversion. I mean, it's almost like um, an allergic reaction to integration by parts. <laughs> and so, <laughs> In the work that I'm going to talk about today, we have not needed integration by parts, but other things we've done have required integration by parts. And some of you who have worked with him, PD, will attest this is a really traumatic part of the paper. <laughs> um, and um, then on the other hand, his generosity and his very, very gentle demeanor um, have made creating math with him a very fulfilling and enjoyable endeavor. So thank you, Guy. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about parameterizing with him. We've, we have many results, let's say, where we build um, a parameterization. And um, what I'm going to do against best pedagogical advice, the time of the day, how tired we all are, is I'm going to start by a theorem. But now you're going to allow me, I'm going to, there will be, it might not be your standard theorem. Okay, so this theorem is the theorem I would like to talk about. It fits many results. Okay, so let me start. Um, and so the theorem says, I want to get the terms correctly, um, a set which is well approximated um, by sets in a well-behaved class has a nice parameterization. <laughs> so if you read, <laughs> yeah, no, it's very, I know, I tell you, the, the talk itself, if I'm going to go to the tools, the tool is very easy and it only contains one tool, the Pythagorean theorem. The other thing is clever applications of it, but that's all what's behind everything I'm going to say. Okay, so um, if you read the abstract, I changed the place of well and uh, nice because this is a very, very um, malleable theorem. It applies in many situations. So um, I know it sounds like a joke, but really, from the, my point of view, I don't know if you're on geese, everything I'm going to talk about fits these. 
Okay, you just have to choose your sets and your notion of approximation. Um, I think that some of my students, in particular Badger and Lewis, got so fed up from reading the same paper every time with different characters that they wrote one to try a paper that tried to pull everything together. But so what I'm going to do is I've chosen um, three well-known papers and one that I considered um, is is in some sense the birthday present to Guy to finally finish this paper. So those will be four papers that I'm going to talk about. And so some of them are old papers. Um, I'm going to confess of those papers. I'm going to, some of them have been published for a long time. I've never, of these papers, I've only talked about one of these results one time. Why? Because they're very technical. So you might be thinking, wow, that was a poor choice of subject. We'll try to, we'll try to make it easy, okay? There will be lots of commentary as we move along. But um, what I would like to do is present the result. But also, if you want, as in a movie, I'm going to present some of the scenes not seen before, some of what led us to look at this question, some of the motivation, some of the frustration that came with the result. Okay? So, I'm going to talk, I'm going to start by talking about snowballs. Okay? So, some of you are familiar with that paper. What's a snowball? So, we all know what a snowflake is, a mathematical snowflake. Um, <laughs> Um, I come from somewhere where I had never seen snowflakes, so my best approximation of a snowflake was <laughs> exactly that. And so what, what, is a, what do I want you to think of when you see a snowflake? A snow, the Van Gogh snowflake is a curve or, that is, lives in R2 that accepts a nice embedding from the real line into R2, but in particular that's, you know, Pure, is not rectifiable, and the length between any two points in the, along the curve is infinite. And so the question is, can you do the same thing in higher dimensions? Namely, can you take Rn, put it inside Rn plus 1, in such a way that in any, any two points have an infinite distance, and is purely unrectifiable. So that's how the snowball started. Okay? Um, well, not really. I'll tell you the truth afterwards. But to introduce the snowballs, the first thing um, I, have to, I would like to talk about is about Reifenberg flat sets. So who was Reifenberg? Reifenberg, um, you've heard his name before. He was a German mathematician um, who was working on minimal surfaces when Finally, the plateau sense in higher dimension, um, the plateau problem in higher dimensions made sense and um, was the first one to prove any result about the regularity of these minimum surfaces. I will state the result. It was not good enough for, for the purposes in geometric analysis. He proved something better four years later and nobody thought of this result any longer. But so let me start by defining a Reifenberg flat set. So we have sigma, who lives in Rn plus k, is a closed set. We say that it's delta Reifenberg flat. And I'll draw a picture. Um, sorry. If for every radius, let's say, between 0 and 1, 0, that doesn't matter, for every um, Q X that belongs to sigma. There exists the following quantity. I'm going to take, um, if you look at, I'm going to define this, dx. I'm going to draw the picture first. If the following thing happens, every, you have your set, you take a point, you take a radius, and you can find a plane. Let's choose it. Such that the set is included in this cylinder here. So if this is R, this is delta R, and the same thing happens for the 
set. So you have a plane, every, there exists a plane, such that when you take the delta R neighborhood, okay, we're gonna do it shorter here, the plane is included there, okay? And now I need to tell you what that means, how I write that, but that's what I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to define these, okay? I use a little bit of a funny notation that allows me to use the same thing until the end of the talk, okay? So, some of you think of these guys as the bilateral beta um, Jones numbers, I, I call them theta, is this is the inf of dxr, I'll tell you who dxr is, of sigma and L, when L is an n plane, and x is true L. And what is this dxr? I want to write it here so that I, we keep it for later. And so I need this number here, sorry, to be less than delta and this dxr, which is a distance that I will use, and of course it's not really a distance, dxr between two closed sets is the following thing, is, sorry, the one over r goes here, one over r, the maximum of the distance of A to B for A that belongs to A intersection BXR and D of B to A. Sorry, I'm forgetting everything today. Soup, soup for B that belongs to B intersection BXR. So it's what you're seeing on the board, okay? So what Reifenberg proves, and when we talk about parameterizations, if we're gonna be fair, some sense Reifenberg was the first one to build one of a parameterization of these types. And honestly, the ideas go back to his parameterizations. What we've done is we've refined his ideas. So his, his theorem said, Reifenberg, 1960, yes, sorry, it's horrendous, is the soup of the distance. So the distance is an infimum. I take the soup for all the points A in A intersection BXR to B, and the same thing to make it symmetric. Yes, it's more or less the Hausdorff distance. And it's not a distance, but okay. Yeah, it is the Hausdorff distance. <laughs> and why did I write it like that for the future? For, you know, within 40 minutes. And, but that actually, David, all of those complaints should be given to Giddy. I'm trying to respect. <laughs> Seriously, though, um, they're, they're the points way to the right versus the ones to the left. I'm, I'm just not sure that it conveys Reifenberg flatness because of something I'm worried about. The, the distance between A and B is the distance between. Oh, oh I see. Right. That's the end. There's the end. Okay. 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 It's no problem. Okay. So, Reifenberg prove that there exists a delta. Delta of n and m greater than zero, such that if sigma is delta Reifenberg flat, sigma is locally a topological disk. If you look carefully, so what happened was in minimal surfaces, that was the first piece of regularity that was proven. It was proven at a, at a, that there were points that were flat like these. People were trying to see how nice they were. This gave him, in fact, um, he didn't write it like that, but you see he gets a holder, a by-holder parametrization. To be, for this result to have been a useful in geometric analysis, the idea was he needed to get it at least C1 
so that you can use the Georgie Nash Moser and start improving on the estimate. So this wasn't enough. So honestly, my impression was that this result was forgotten for a long time. Then four years later, he proved an epiparametric um, inequality in that setting. That was useful. That's how he got his C1 alpha, and from there things work, and nobody looked at this. I learned about this result. Um, I was very stuck in my thesis. My advisor used to go away for four months at a time. I asked Rick Shane for if he had ever seen a parametrization in a dramatic constant. He said, oh, there's this guy, Reifenberg, that proved something like that, but I don't really know. And he said, but look in Mori, there's a proof of it. Okay, so I should say Mori includes, um, Mori proves this statement with approximation by C2 surfaces. I mean, that also works. Um, and, and that was what I learned about it. And I didn't use it for a long time. But, but it was a very um, useful thing. Apparent, one of the important things is there's no holes here. Okay? Really, the smallness translates, and there's no holes. Okay. Um, so, as I said, the his parametrization was by Holler. I won't write the details. It was a matter of tracking it. In fact, his parametrization is more than a parametrization. It's an embedding, and it's a tame embedding. Locally, it doesn't change orientation. OK, but, okay. so as I said, what does this have to do with snowballs? What happened? So what happened is that in 1997, um, Chigurh and Colleen show that if you take a sequence of um, spaces with Ricci curvature bounded below, away from a set of large co-dimension, the, the, these sets admit uh, by holder parametrization. Okay, and so I was at a lecture that Toby gave, Toby Colding, and um, he explained in detail the proof, and that the impression I had is that the limit of this thing was, of course, a metric space, that they were defining the notion of flatness in metric spaces using the hauser gromov distance, and what they did is they, their geometers, they built, um, holder pa local patches. And so I, I went to Guy and told him, oh, it would be really cool if we could, you know, maybe this is not only true for, um, for, the, for these limits, but for a general metric space. And we started trying to read that paper. And, um, and as you'll see, is a kind of a theme in our work together. We, we were not able to. I mean, we were confused. Um, I don't, I think there's two things. Um, one of it, a big factor, is that we, we have a short attention span and we don't have patience. And so, as you will see, some of the motivation here, this one was an attempt to understand something better. Another one was, well, you'll see, it, it was the same thing. So, what happened really was that we started looking at this and we realized that actually Reifenberg's theorem holds in a, for metric spaces. I will not state it. I mean, I say I'm going to try to. It's technical, but I don't want to introduce the technicality. So, but what it says, if a metric space is flat in the Hausdorff-Gromov distance, then you can build an embedding from the right Rn into the space. And this embedding is by holder with respect to the metric, you know, on the metric space. But, so, an application of it, the corollary of that, was that we were able to build the snowballs, okay? So, the snowballs are um, a generalization of the Van Gogh snowflake, and that one I would like to um, write. Perfect. And um, you see you're going to ask me, but we don't see the thetas. I mean, how does this relate to the beginning of your talk? So let me state. So unless otherwise indicated, the theorems are joint theorems with Guy. Um, so given n, n, n. Um, and gamma small enough. Let 
There exists an embedding. Embedding. So an important, a key thing here is that we're going from Rn into Rn plus one. Okay, so like the Van Gogh snowflake into one more, such that V of x minus V of y is less than C x minus one to the one minus gamma. And the key point here is also that the exponent I have on this, we have on this side is exactly the same. Okay, so we really, um, and be, so we are, I'm going to add a line to this theorem, but we are really uh, folding in every single direction the same way. So I'm create, we are creating bumps in every direction. These answered um, a question of um, Stephen Sams, who wanted to know whether you could have um, surfaces with lot, lots of, um, purely unrectifiable curves. Bishop at the time, at the same time we did this, had done a similar construction. His doesn't wrinkle all the time, ours wrinkles. Um, let me um, also say that phi can be made, is quasi symmetric and can be extended. To be quasi symmetric. And here, I would like in all of Rn plus one. And here I would like to thank, I would like to thank um, Juha Heinonen who um, bogus that this had to be true. I said, well, yes, possibly. I said, well, why don't you write it? And okay. So we thank you, Juha, for um, helping us do that, for pushing us to do that. Okay. So, yeah. Yes, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so we extended. Okay. Um, so you might be saying she started by defining these weird things there, then she states this theorem that doesn't seem to have anything to do with those, but okay. No, I mean, I use them there. There's nothing about those things mentioned here. What's going on? So this is a construction. I started with something that was flat. And in order, what do you do when you go, you do a Van Gogh snowflake? You make a bump, and then you make bulk bumps. And so to construct it, what we started doing was making more bumps. And how did we quantify the bumps? I mean, you know, when, you have to move in every single direction, was by making bumps, making, putting sines and cosines, and being able to estimate the, the thetas, and controlling the thetas so that everything was being distorted in every single direction, okay? So this, behind this construction, is a deep control of how those numbers change from one radius to the next, okay? From one scale to the next, okay? Um, so that's one of the things. This was a this was a fun theorem to prove, one that we never thought would be especially useful. And <laughs> you know, we did it because it was fun. And I have it, it's interesting how many times I've gotten request we've gotten requests of could you do this to it or do this to that. And the truth is, I think we did it, we sent it, and we forgot about it. But um, it has been the basis for other constructions. Now, let me go to the second result I would like to talk about, which is, um, is something that we call a generalization of Reifenberg's theorem in R3. The motivation for this work came from a question of Depot, but then Guy, I think, got more interested because he started reading, for his minimal sets, he started reading the work of Gene Taylor he had difficulty getting through the proof and decided that it would be way easier to come up with a different proof. <laughs> and so in some sense, that's what we are gonna do. So how does the next theorem that I'm gonna state fit into that? So this one, the good sets were the planes. In that theorem, what we're gonna do is we're gonna approximate our set by 
one of three types of sets. These are all minimal cones in R3. Okay? So the types of sets, so for, um, for minimal cones, so let me draw you the minimal cones in R3. This is a minimal cone in R3. This is a plane. It's a minimal cone of type 1. Um, sorry, my drawing skills are not ideal, so I better remember how I drew it, that it looked like it had perspective. Okay? This is also the intersection of, with the sphere of a minimal cone. What you're seeing is three planes that, come at, that intersect at an angle of um, 120 degrees. These are of type 2. Now I see. And now you're going to see type 3. Um, unfortunately, my drawing skills get worse and worse as the types go up. What you're seeing here is a tetrahedron. Here you're seeing three faces, but that happens in every direction. Okay, so type three. And you should think of these. These are cones over, you do the cone over the sphere. Okay. And so the question is, so these, of course, the rotation and translations of these are the good sets. Okay. And, um, why did we care about these sets? Because um, it had been proven that these were the only minimal cones in, um, in R3. And so the goal was to parameterize sets that were well approximating by these sets. Why? Because you have a minimal surface in R3, you blow up, you go to one of these guys. Okay? So here's the theorem. Um, given alpha, again a positive number, and small positive number, there exists an epsilon such that the following thing holds. If sigma in R3 is well, appro is well approximated, by a minimal cone, by a minimal cone, so let me explain IE for every x in sigma and for every r, let me say less than 1, um, there exists, this is a minimal cone, either of any of, the, so by a minimal cone I mean one of these three types of guys, then such that um, d of x r of sigma in, sorry, z of x r is less than epsilon for epsilon less than epsilon zero, so that's what it means to be well approximated, then exactly the same what you expect is. So there exists a phi, here I'm going to have to put a two, sorry, zero belongs to sigma, there exists a phi that goes from B0, 3 half, this is a 3 ball, into B0, 2, another 3 ball. I will draw a picture in a minute of what I'm trying to say, such that um, phi of x minus phi of y is less than C x minus y to the 1 minus alpha. See, please notice here the different exponent, 1 plus alpha, and the key point, and I don't know if you see that low, let me bring it so everybody can. And the key point is that sigma intersection B0, 1 is included in this phi of this ball, which is contained in sigma intersection B0, 2. 
Okay, and I have to say um, there's something more important that exists. Phi, I, I um, no, this is not correct. I need to put here intersection. Sorry, I'm missing a piece. It's a global map, but it's B of B, zero, three halves, intersection Z of zero, two, and intersection B of zero, two, intersection sigma. Okay? So what on earth am I saying? What I'm saying is that we can build a global map, imagine the unit ball to the unit ball, such that this set, which is locally well approximated by these, happens to be the image of one of those three things. And which one? Well, whatever you had at the large scale. Okay. So, um, as I said, what was interesting about this is that Thierry de Pau asked Guy this question. Thierry asked me this question in different occasions, and then we're together at a conference in Purdue when we start talking about how we've been thinking about this question that Thierry asked us. And uh, that's how we got working on this one. Um, this is an example of what happens when um, you work um, with Guy. We, we wrote it for these cones. In the meantime, this is a very long paper, took a long time. In the meantime, he realized that he needed these for something else. Namely, he, well, this, so why does this work? Well, because cones of type one are very far from cones of type two, and cones of type two are very far from cones of type three in the house of distance sense, but their angles match. And so he realized, oh, that's why this works. And so he decided, after the paper that had taken a year and a half to be reviewed was accepted, he made a minor modification of 40 pages changing the angles, which was not to the delight of the editors. And the <laughs> it was <laughs> okay. got published. <laughs> yeah, it went smoothly for him because I was the handling editor, the, the handling author, so that's why it was smooth. Okay, so um, in some sense, on the other hand, you know, we've built parametrizations, but I'm not here to claim that we're the only ones who have built parametrizations. So I'm not going to write the names, I'm going to say some of the names. I think Rob, Rob, half of the room here has built a parametrization of one type or another. Um, I think I would like to, um, so the first I would like to, the first person that, you know, built a bi uh parametrization was Aswad. Aswad was very, I mean, the question of whether if you take a metric space, for example, can be embedded by Lipschitz into um, a Euclidean space is something that has attracted lots of interest, and as what showed that there is a condition such that you can do it. Um, it's not constr I mean, doesn't give you excellent uh, bounds on how big the space is, but it works. Um, when I think the reason Guy and I were able to start working on this together is because um, he of I see uniform rectifiability, especially when I started learning about it as building parametrizations, except that on some sets that has, I mean, except some holes, and I had built some parametrizations, but again, everybody who has worked on uniform rectifiability, and I think here is fair to, first of all, um, mention Peter Jones, then David, Sams, Jerison, Matila, Melnikov, Berdera, and Tolsa have done lots of parametrizations and have taken care, you know, have kept track of these uh, thetas. Um, then on the other side, on the geometric analysis side, Hart, Lynn, Simon, Chigger, Colding, Ranchbard, and now more recently, Neighbor and Valtorta have been keeping track, building parametrization and keeping track of these beta numbers. Okay? Um, several of my students, Badger, Lewis, Merhesh, and then of course Bishop, Jones, and Lerman did it. Ranan, um, who uh, we will thank, I will thank in the next section. And then, of course, Price, Matila, um, 
Besikovic in many ways. So, I mean, I see these as many people have been interested in these sort of things. We've all approached it for slightly different angles, but we've all dealt with being well approximated, at least by planes. Okay, and now I'm gonna um, talk, and so I have 15 minutes, or 17 minutes, okay. That's, um, I'm gonna talk about the last two kind of bodies of work. Um, <coughs> the first of them is now um, that he titled Hollenberg, and the next one that he titled Lipberg. So let me write those names for you. One of them you know very well is that it didn't appear with that title in the literature because not all the authors were equally thrilled. Hollenberg and Lipberg. Okay? And so you know this one as Reifenberg, and you can figure out how he came up with this lovely uh, name here. Reifenberg parametrizations for sets with holes. Of course, you see where did it came. Hall, Lemberg, and by, I don't know, etymology, is in that case, this will be this should be a, this is a, I will talk at the end about this work, because it's a approximation by sets, um, parametrizations for sets that are well approximated by Lipschitz graphs, okay? And I'm not talking about Lipschitz graphs with small constant, I'm talking about Lipschitz graphs, okay? So, um, so these, these were done, of, Hollenberg was done a few years ago, and soon after Hollenberg was done, we realized that actually similar ideas will apply to parametrizing um, sets that were well approximated by big Lipschitz graphs. The truth is that the way this paper, which I will remember, remind one or two of the results in there, but some of you know it came, is Neshan Wikera Masekera, who um, is a former student of Leon Simon, who has done a huge amount of work on um, the singular set of uh, minimal submanifolds, especially when the density is bigger than two, and ha was trying to understand the singular set, asked us whether one could do Reifenberg for um, sets with holes. And what happens is that the singular set of an energy minimizing harmonic function, the singular set of a minimal submanifold, satisfies something like Reifenberg with hole. I mean, it, you know, only one side approximation. And so we, we sat down, we did it, and when we finished, we told Neshan, we have it. Can you use it? And ne this came to Nishan at about time. Nishan never replied. And so we thought it was, you know, this paper was useless. I mean, that there was no reason to publish. And I think that the only person, besides the two of us who seemed interested at the beginning, was Rana. And I think if he had not kind of showed interest and bug us, and <laughs> um, we might not get up have done anything with it. I mean, he spent lots of time talking to us about it. We finally decided to publish. And then, um, and then soon after we did Lippenberg, but since we thought the first one was useless, the second one was even worse, so why would we um, do anything with it? We put it in shared Dropbox um, with the intention to look at it, and so, my birthday gift to Guy was to finally finish it, and we're almost there. You know, I think with both the present for 60th, it's like with wedding presents, you have a one-year cushion, okay? <laughs> but so let me remind you what Hollenberg is, and let me tell you what the new result is, okay? So, maybe Hollenberg, so now, rather than talk about the, Bilateral beta, I'm going to talk about simply beta infinity. So once again, sigma 
is in Rn plus k, and we define the beta infinity. This one is familiar to many of you. It's simply 1 over r, the inf over all planes containing x of the soup of this distance. y to L for y that belongs to sigma intersection dxr. So the difference is that now we can have sets with holes. Let me give you, this is a line, has a hole, beta zero, but you have holes, okay? So these numbers were introduced by Jones, Bishop, Jones, Bishop, Jones, and Lerman work on them. Let me, um, I'm going to define the following function, which is the sum. X, 10 minus K. And there's a squared here from K equals one to infinity, okay? So this is the Jones function. And the theorem says, we're gonna put it somewhere else so that we can The theorem says there exists an epsilon zero. It depends on n. I should have perfect this here. Okay. Such that if sigma is closed, zero belongs to sigma, and for every x that belongs to B intersection C0, 10, sorry, the 10 is just for the convenient, and every R between 10 and zero, we have that the set is well approximated. I put an R. The set is well approximated by planes, and this is bounded in B0, 10, this of course means intersection sigma, then there exists a bilipsis parametrization. Free from Rn plus k into, so all of our parametrizations are, are global. So what do I mean? They go from the whole space into the whole space. They don't move too much. So D thing is less than epsilon, C epsilon maybe, is by Lipschitz. And moreover is of course the identity, we can make it the identity um, at infinity, really outside the ball of radius, outside. B, well, let me know, because I have to assume something else. Let me leave it like that, okay? Oh, of course. And phi of Rn intersection, and there exists an open, and there exists U open, and Rn such that T of u is exactly sigma intersection b0, 1. Okay? And I put an open set because, okay, they might be little edges or whatever. Okay? So we have um, a parametrization. We are assuming, well, let me not tell you how I am lying to you exactly. Um, but it's just a detail. Um, but basically, this was Reifenberg with holes. It told us, and so it really told us that if we had these pieces a little bit all over, but they were well approximated and this guy was bounded, then we were able to construct the parametrization and make the set sit in there, okay? I should have said equal, it's included 
since I put the holes. Okay. Sorry? No, RN plus K. This is a global map. So I have, I go from the, from the, the whole RN plus K into the whole RN plus K. I am assuming that RN is my first initial, the, the first good map, and that's the one that I'm sending there. Yeah. Okay? Yes, sorry. Yes, this is n dimensional. Absolutely, otherwise I'm lying. Huh? It's, it's one is inside the other. I am trying to find a way to write it without lying too, too much. Huh? Um, but I, I'm having, I have holes. I have holes, okay? <laughs> so um, I w And then this is included in phi of, I don't know, Rn. And I, okay. Yeah, I have holes. That's why I cannot have an equality. Okay. And so what would I like to, um, what's at the basis of these? Because you see these and you're, um, the, the key point to this is a discrete version, okay? So what I would like to emphasize and what I've, you know, once you work with something, the, what you did the first time, you do the theorem, you prove a theorem, you're happy, you say, okay, this is how it goes, and you, at least I don't, at the first time I look at the theorem, go back and think, okay, what's really, really happening? But once you do the same thing several times, you think it might be, might be the better idea to figure out what's happening so I don't have to repeat it again. And so what's at the basis of these is that one can create a coherent family. What does that mean? You can take a good set of points, a good set of radii. So I have the points are RJ nets and associated to those RJ nets, you can um, associate coherent planes, for example. So the planes, what does it mean, coherent planes? Planes where um, we don't have too much oscillation, for example. Okay, so if you prove the discrete version, you will be able to prove the whole version. What on earth do I mean? So um, let me, given the time and that I'm seeing and being looked at, rather than give another version of these or the, of the holder version of these, what I really would like to do is state what happens when you approximate by Lipschitz graphs, okay? Why is this different? Because so far, all our approximation have been by flat things. Right now, we're gonna approximate by things that really have spikes, okay? So, um, Maybe. So the way we're going to do this is for every point and for every radius, we're going to choose. So we have sigma, we're close set. We have x and sigma. We have a radius less than 1. And we choose a function, f of xr, that goes from a plane, n plane. This guy contains x into pxr. And we look at G of XR, which is the graph of F of, F of XR. And what we do is we assume that 
laminate. And we have, so the theorem says, I don't know how to assume it. Given epsilon greater than zero and m bigger than zero. So this is the Lipschitz constant. This is the epsilon that approximates and may be given the term such that sigma is, I'm going to write it in English given the time, and then if you are interested afterwards, you can ask me. Sigma is well approximated by Lipschitz graph as above. Graph as above. The planes, the planes P, X, R, P, and P, X, R over 2 are coherent. That means the tilt is no more than epsilon. Um, the planes, so the family of P, and I should be more precise, P 10 to the minus K, 10 to the minus K minus 1. The planes P 10 to the minus K and P Y 10 to the minus K are coherent. And that means their angle is less than epsilon again. A little bit more if X and Y are less than 10 to the minus K plus 2. Okay? This is a hypothesis or conclusion? No, these are my hypotheses. So I have a set which is well approximated by graphs. The graphs were the, the graphs satisfy the compatibility assumption. Okay? That means the angle between the planes where the graphs are defined is not too big and the planes are not too far from each other as sets. Okay? The approximation in this case is bilateral. We have one that's one-sided. I need more hypotheses. There's no way I'm going to put them in there. Okay. The Lipschitz constant is M. So you don't allow the Lipschitz constant to grow. Okay. And to start with, and at scale, one, Sigma is flat. Guy doesn't like these. I should say sigma is close to a C2 submanifold. That's fine, but flat is easier. Right from flat. Then there exists a byholder parameterization. Exactly. Exactly like the one produced of sigma by a, locally by an open set of RN. Okay, so what's the difference? I know I'm over there. What's the difference between these and the flat? So far, most of the parameterizations we've built or have been built are when you are approximating by flat things. And when they were not flat, where there were the minimal cones, well, actually, they were flat except that they intersect at very specific places. Now we are looking at things that are well approximated by graphs, so they're Vs. And it's true, we're asking, and I will say one word about that, we're asking a compatibility conditions on these planes, but because we have large Constant, that doesn't, it's not the same as telling the two graphs are nearby, okay? Now, also, when we are in codimension one, so this set, I should have been more precise, sorry about that. When k is one, we do not need the compatibility conditions, okay? So you can simply, by being well approximated by the graph, get the compatibility condition, okay? And it might be that we don't need the compatibility condition in general, but that we don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Are there any questions?
comments, parametrizations. Thank you. Do you, so, to me, the last theorem seems much stronger. So do you have an example of something that's not better than a cork curve and that's, uh, by Lip that's close to Lipschitz graphs? So that satisfies the last hypothesis, but it's not more than the by holder. No. <laughs> yes. This one is a by holder parametrization. So do we get more? I mean, is something that twists? Yes. I think. Um, Do I have an example? Well, not really other than just taking the by holder thing. The truth is, what's my expectation? What would we like to do? What we actually really, really want to do is construct by Lipschitz parametrization by putting the same conditions that we had over there. OK, so our ultimate goal really is um, to approximate, imagine that you are close <coughs> to start with and that the corresponding beta numbers add up we would like to have a by Lipschitz parametrization. And do I have an application in mind? Yes, but I prefer not to talk about it yet since I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. Okay. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Could you say what it means to be well approximated by Lipschitz graph briefly? Exactly. It's exactly what you imagine. <laughs> <laughs> DXR, there exists a Lipschitz graph of a function. So in this context, it means this. It means that at every point x in sigma intersection, the unit ball imagines 0 is inside. And for every radius less than 1, you can find one of those f's with Lipschitz constant less or equal than m, such that the graph of that thing approximates this. OK? The compatibility condition tells you that from scale to scale, the angle of the planes is less than epsilon. You need, actually, it's a little bit more because you're, well, yes, in this case, the angle of the planes is less than epsilon. And this tells you that as sets, remember, these are the affine planes, as sets, this set and this set is less than epsilon if you are nearby. OK, that's what it says. I suppose epsilon must be small than your n. <laughs> NK. Just a second. I think the K here is not the same K no, as there. No, it's what, not. Okay. And it turns out that in my note, that guy was an M. But OK, I had already made a mistake earlier. So yeah, that, Just, this K, you see, this is a very large K. OK. <laughs> <laughs> But do you think that a set which satisfies this assumption could be actually a Reifenbeck flat set? Or? No. Not necessarily? This Lipschitz graph. Ah, OK. Yeah. No, they're not Reifenberg flat. Okay, okay. The parametrization doesn't have constant close to 1. This is a big constant but parametrization. Is piecewise Reifenberg flat? Huh? Piecewise yeah. Reifenberg flat? Nope. Uh. No, these ones, fortunately, because if not, I'm doing exactly the same thing again. <laughs> Any other question? No? If not, let's thank the speaker again.